Welcome to a podcast series where I have conversations with people whose practice brings creativity, technology, culture, history and future together. I am Fazan Naveed and this is The Present Future. Hi Zain, how are you? Hi Fazan, I am good, how are you? I am great, thank you, thank you for joining us today. And thank you okay, for having uh, me. For the you and uh, for our listeners, I would like you to give us your short introduction and please. Uh, I am Zen Nakvi. By profession, I am a creative entrepreneur and a designer. I've been working mainly in design for about a decade, but my practice is deeply rooted in tech. That's why I usually get to deal with a lot of new technologies, a lot of new developments. And specifically, uh, things that, you know, make us change how we are creating works and how culture is being impacted by the advent of technologies such as LLMs, Web3, and AI specifically. Ah, okay. So you said that the how it has changed the culture, how it has, the technology has helped to evolve the culture. How do you think AI has played in image-making generators? specifically, had played its part in it? Uh, I think AI is impacting the overall creation of a lot of things, but we are going to specifically talk about image generation, uh, which is, I think, for the first time, image making usually has been relegated to, you know, humans. So we've used a, you know, different technologies as tools, whether it was the printing press, whether it was Photoshop, whether it was, you know, uh, whatever way of copying images you were making, you know, photocopiers and stuff. But all of a sudden we have this tool, which is essentially not only, you know, helping us make images, but it is also, you know, making images by what we are telling it, you know, by what we are feeding into it. So essentially, AI has become this perpetual machine that can create images on its own beyond a certain point that till now we had only relegated to humans. And it's understanding of style, form, of, you know, material, it's expanding day by day. Mm -hmm. So what I've understood, like, in, 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 in a simpler way, you were saying that they have been learning throughout our life, adopting styles, understanding styles. And the same thing, this is what a machine is doing. This is what machine learning basically does. Like it yeah, uh, collects the data and builds on it. So do you think these image generators are the artists or are they the co-creators? How do you take that? Like, would you consider I them separate we're... artists or, you know, co-creators than you? I think if you look at the history of digital painting and digital art in the early 90s, uh, this debate reared its head back then as well. That if an artist is making work on Photoshop or Illustrator or Microsoft Paint, is it the tool that should be mentioned as well? Because these machines, despite their, you know, however brilliant they are, they are still machines to me. They are still the tools, you know. You need to know how to use that tool in order to create whatever you are creating. Because here's the thing, if you look at how the average person is using an AI image generator, their results are pretty similar. There aren't, you know, very groundbreaking or thought-provoking works out there. But when you see somebody who has been in the practice, whether it's a fashion designer, whether it's a photographer, whether it is somebody, for instance, you know, an animator, just a couple of days ago, I saw this work that was being done by, you know, this guy who works at Pixar. And the kind of work that he was generating, nothing like that had existed before. Because here was a person who had, you know, the understanding of history of animation, who had the understanding of form in animation, 
who had this understanding of you know what style would work where and he was bringing all that knowledge into an image generator you know okay. so without i think the understanding you cannot just jump in and create anything so i mean if we use the same logic for example with let's say you know word generators chat gpt or something uh i don't think if you understand if you don't understand how to write a novel that you can write a very good novel even with chat gpt's help you need to understand how the structure of a novel works you need to understand how the plotting works you need to understand what pacing is so what all these ais right now are doing are they are built on large scale large scale models right so whether they are medium scale models or large models large language models they are mimicking things that already exist we do that in a certain manner as well right yeah i mean our practice is a mix of different photographers different artists different writers but then the important thing with us is we also think in terms of our geographical reality we also think in terms of our political reality we also think in terms of our i would say physiological reality i mean if you come from you know a specific kind of a background your genealogy is very different from my genealogy you were born in a different city i was born in a different city you were raised in a certain manner but ai has doesn't have that right so an ai that is being operated let's say in new york or at washington it's pretty much the same unless and until you the artist tell you know the ai software that do this in specific manner and one thing because i mean i've been playing around with ais for almost a year is that specifically when it comes to asian art south asian you know motifs ai does not do a great job because a lot of <laughs> that stuff is not in the models you know so it is not doing that great a job with you know different languages so for instance i told you you know that as well that i was trying to read it john elia you know and there are people who just started to you know experiment with poetry and ai and it's a fun topic it's definitely a fun topic uh, but the thing is that despite beyond a certain point uh the ai couldn't make sense of the work that was there because its understanding of urdu was not that great as like let's say it's like you know it's understanding of code or of english and so it on is and so I, this this brings me to the point like generally like whatever data on any field majorly we have is based on the western ideas and concepts for example the other day i was visiting a building a public building it's newly made and they had made the benches like uh, perforated from the walls but the dimensions were quite off like I'm six feet tall, and even my feet were not touching the ground. So I figured it out. It's a Scandinavian design, and probably they have made it according to the people from Holland because they're tall people. So, and all the data we have for DNA is for DNA testing is from the west and the north. We don't have data from South Asia or Indian region. So definitely, it will take a toll on what data is fed to AI, and it's going to create something from that lens. Which brings me to another point. Um, I I uh, I'll come back to your point later. I have another question right now. Is that because I'm particularly more interested uh, in the field of photography in the time of image generators, and because you know, uh, it has always been the motive to make realistic images. So, what do you think? Like, so uh, are there any uh, skills required for AI photography related to more artists or creatives such as writers? Because language is not everyone's strong suit artists communicate uh, better visually rather than their words uh, would this also be a hindrance or would it polish both the writing skills and the image making skills yeah i i'll go back to the concept of animation to answer this if i may okay so yeah, so i i hope you've seen spiderman in the spider verse the first movie yeah. right yeah that's yeah. so needed so before that the industry was in love with the pixar style of storytelling which was very clean very very you know highly rendered these very claymation looking 3d type image you know uh, animation style 
but all of us spider verse came all of a sudden and they were like you know what we are going to take the medium of the comic book which was like you know cross hatches misprints you know this feeling of having a certain kind of paper this feeling of having watercolor drops and their genius was they rendered an entire film then had a team of artists work on those individual renders by hand you know so they were essentially creating this technique which was 3d as well as 2d and post that you can see every single kids animation or adult animation try to mimic that style you know all of a sudden even the 3d big shots they were like you know what we do not need to go for the realistic style so i technically have a i mean my point of view is that nobody wants to see the realistic thing you know so like the word uncanny valley yeah. we can reach human life but then the question becomes that do we really need human life you know another example would be early on in the life of the iphone or the ipad you remember there used to be this animation that agar if you're like you know reading some i book the page actually used to turn and it had some sound effects as well like whoop, you know which essentially after a couple of years everybody realized was pretty stupid you're not reading a book you know yeah <clears throat> now that all of us can... yeah, yeah please carry on or carry on carry on so now all of us can read like a scroll so my question right now with ai is that yes a lot of people are trying to go for highly realistic you know but then the breakthroughs are going to happen in areas that are not realistically possible you know like so can you for instance a lot if i make like you know just to explain this so if you're looking at painters who usually try to paint the night you know like there are a lot of painters like you know i can't can recall a couple of them right now. a lot of north american you know uh, these painters who like do like this liminal kind of paintings you know like very moody uh tents with coyotes and so on or even old painters you know from the 1800s who were trying to depict like this uh cowboy western kind of a feel now yeah. they have a very limited range of palette that they are working with you know so it's like you know it's blues it's deep greens you do not see a lot of reds there because obviously i our eye does not you know recognize red rat go it almost looks to us as if it's like a deep black and then all of a sudden these painters were still painting red you know the whole image was of the light type but they're still painting red flowers you know and their skill came in handy there because they were showing us something that does not exist in nature it is impossible for a red flower to look bright red during let's say 2 or 3 am in the morning it's something yeah. that is just not happening in nature but because it was happening in that painting it sort of played with our perception you know it sort of played with our way of you know thinking in a similar aspect whenever let's say moonlight is shown in films you know it's always shot day for night so they're shooting the entire sequence in day but then color grading it in a manner that it looks like it's night you know right. even old raj kapoor films and so on used to you know use this <laughs> trick because, because the thing yeah. was the other or so they won't use the filter obviously exactly exactly the other option is that you have like this night scene which is pitch black which nobody yeah. wants you know so it is yes. near me i personally think that there needs to be a balance where you are showing re- reality but it is through a lens you know okay it is definitely through a lens it cannot be like a 100% reality based thing i don't think that's going to work i don't think that's going to create an- anything that you know people will be interested in so, for example all these metaverses and all these you know immersive worlds that people are trying to build imagine if i think the just to understand this it's a comparison between let's say pubg or you know what's the other game called uh fortnite yeah fortnite fortnite so it's a comparison 
Fortnite and let's say COD, you know. Okay. I do think there are a lot of people who want to play COD in real life because that's literally <laughs> what a white war it is. It's violent. It's like you're literally an army man. But this is, this is uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I, I differ. I don't really differ here. But what I really find fascinating about using the AI for image making is it's just like any other artist who creates spaces or places or objects or things that doesn't really exist, right? Even they look uh, believable. One of the really good example is like that bridge on the euro. I don't know if it's fifty euro or the designer made it. That that way, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. the fake bridge this, of the euro. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> but this brings me to this question. Like, I, I, I sometimes wonder, like, uh, now what is the then what is the role of photography in the age of image generators? So, it, uh, I personally think photography is going through the same kind of identity crisis that painting went through when photography itself came you know because all of a sudden you, know, you you understand that much better than me that all of a sudden you know painting was reduced to okay what am i supposed to do now because painting was you know recording history recording a certain moment in time and all of a sudden there was this tool which did it much better which did it for much cheaper and now the camera essentially is asking a question that what am I supposed to do? But again, what I think is like these image generators can take photography to the next place as well. Specifically, let's say if we're talking about post photography, where you can use an AI to change something instantly. So for example, one amazing thing, let's say that the new Samsung phones are doing is that they're letting you edit on the go. Yeah. So for example, we, we just take this, you know, picture of me and you talking, and then you say, you know what, like that little door that is coming in my frame, just remove that, you know, and your phone instantly removes that door. Something that essentially took Photoshop and a person to do a good five, 10 minutes is now done in a couple of seconds. But what it also leads to is this synthetic reality of people and places existing which do not look like the same in real life. As it you know, always be the same. <laughs> not to look yeah, and it, actually look. It, uh, uh, <laughs> no, it has been. It has been. But do you understand that this is coming from a desire to live in that imaginary world, if we may call it that, or that synthetic world? So, I mean, yeah. another example would be, for instance, at a certain time, only celebrities were focused on their selves, right? Right. That, okay, this is who I am. This is what my lifestyle is. Today, every teenager is doing that, you know, even if they don't have that lifestyle, you know. So with social media, people were posting pictures of these spots, whether it's a tourist spot, that does not look like that in real life. And when you go there, you also see the amount of people that are there. You see the trash that is there. You see all these, you know, issues with the buildings and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, getting to the point that when you come to this air brushing of reality, you know, how does that change us as humans? Because that also connects to our earlier conversation that that is also a kind of uncanny valley. So, for instance, if you look at, let's say, <clears throat> social media influencers, Somehow or the other, this they all have this, you know, uh, Kim Kardashian and her sister's kind of aesthetic. Whether it's good or bad, that's a different thing. But they're the same kind of photocopies. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I, I, I think I'm getting it. <laughs> yes. But, you know, so now the thing is that, that in real life, if you've met somebody who's had those kind of surgeries, or whatever those, you know, uh, injections and whatever are, those people look very, very, I, I don't know, very plastic, very doll-like. They're almost like action figures from the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> but this, this brings me to, yeah, two, two other questions. One is like, uh, 
how to phrase it is uh, we're talking about like this this is how the ai is what you just said like the phones let you do things on the go well so this is something that and that's more of an editing software's job rather than photographing it because you photograph it and then you edit it or in the old times you used to go to dark room to edit it but i'm talking generally about photography as a medium as an image maker not image editor he, this this is one part of the question and another one is that uh let's just say when dslr first came out and everybody began taking photographs it took a while for people to realize that not everyone is a photographer right and even in traditional photography where your settings and auto mode differ there is a difference between a photograph and an artwork in the medium of photography now how does one differentiate between a regular image generated through ai and an ai image as an artwork i think it's going to sound very cliche and i can't believe i'm really saying that <laughs> uh, because this, this this is something that i don't usually say uh but i believe it's going to come down to the intention you know the intention of the artist and as, as that's why i said as cliche as it this is, yeah this is really interesting and this is actually becoming more visible that the intention matters because you know um what i have noticed it's just for observation i don't have any doubt for that per se is that uh, in, in last couple of years uh, ai has made image making more accessible to the masses right as compared to previous years because of its accessibility it's on your phone it's on apps it's everywhere you can feed your own data but the question also becomes then more important than what kind of art and, and is it art or is it not art and more people from who are not from the art background are creating more visuals just as people suddenly became photographers when cameras started to Uh, be better in phones, so it's again history is repeating in itself in a different form. So that's why I was asking this question. Like, yes, intention does matter. Anyways, I think you have answered this one for me. But if you want to elaborate, please do. I just think like if we categorize, let's say photography, you're gonna have the category of photographers who are artists who are making, you know, who are using the medium of photography to create art right then you have photographers who are maybe more like scientists and i would include in the scientist category maybe wildlife photographers you know uh photographers who go and photography up and like photograph uh you know natural phenomena storm chasers mountain type photography not like the like the type that you would hang in your kitchen but more like you know the history of a uh, of a certain peak you know in different seasons is in different climates over 10 years maybe so that's more like science based photography then you have people who are using it for let's say commercial purposes which can be film making because obviously film is you know a medium that is deeply tied with the history of camera itself so obviously you can't like let go of it and then you have like the commercial commercial kind which i think would be I mean like you know fashion photographers who are creating these immersive worlds these costumed you know affairs but their understanding of material their understanding of how light works on like human skin is very different from let's say that of a wedding photographer that person is more in the business of you know capturing member babies so when it comes to that i think and all of these five categories if you like let's say like you know replace the person with ai i think the results are going to be very right because right now i mean till the day comes that you have a drone which is like you know fitted with ai and it takes all the images of your wedding you know i mean it, that's going to be an interesting product but then you like you know it's have it's like having a personal photographer all the time and maybe this might happen in the future you know that your phone is just floating around taking pictures of you who knows but they, so, there is a drone like that that does that yeah yeah probably so, so probably yeah to, to, talking of futures uh, future we have talked about the impact and question of ai yeah. photography but do you think that it will uh, the ai will ever take over photography on a whole 
just like you know digital camera took over analog in a mass sense do you think that they yeah, will take over photography image the, when i say ai i mean image generators yeah i think even if you look at photography like that there are still people who are playing around with older lenses with older stocks with trying to replicate you know the specific look of the older cameras because i think that is where the original uh, breakthrough lies you know so a very you know a small thing to look at would be how all of a sudden because gen z grew up in like this very airbrushed kind of a reality that they reverted back to the 90s they've gone back to the y2k aesthetic you know although y2k does not make sense in 2023 at all you know but because the thing is that they were raised in such an airbrushed kind of you know this very sleek reality of the millennials maybe that they rejected it overall they well you know the 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 fun thing is i've said you know like three times but the fun thing is they brought you know memphis back so memphis <laughs> was something that was almost forgotten by millennials like this yeah. entire design trend it was forgotten uh the other day you know it's it's a very funny thing if there's a janet jackson song it's based in the future but it almost works like a prophecy it has so much going on that is happening in 2023 from the clothes to the fashion to like yeah the video is i think from 2001 2002 but it is shot in a square format so if you look at it today it seems like it's been shot for snapchat but snapchat would not exist for another 10 years you know so that's the fun part and i think specifically in art there have been artists and there have been photographers who have predated inventions you know whose work when you look at it it seems like okay it was created by using vectors you know but yeah. the fun part is that vectors did not exist during their time you know or there are artists for example who have this kind of painterly style where it looks like as if you know uh it's pixar's work or it's for example you know something done by a computer but the but the fun part is that these guys were working in the 60s and the 70s when computers were commercial for oh. so okay moving on to the next section sorry luna is here our cat okay no, no, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> i'm 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 coming towards more of a photography side now uh we are also running out of time i might have to set another session all right <laughs> sure. Sure. okay but um okay. so thinking of this would you think that teaching photography in especially at university level requires the same number of hours same number of sorry hours amount of time hours. credit hours or generally if, if it is a 6 hour studio or a photography to a course do you think it should require yeah. less or more i think hey, hey, here comes the place where i have a bone to pick with academia over all because to like our 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 general model of education is based in the 19th century right yeah you know and my question is what other thing from 19th century has survived till now nothing absolutely nothing you know banking has changed we don't send letters anymore we don't send you know phone email anymore but yet we are fixated on this idea of uh education that is still rooted in the 19th century so for instance even in pakistan you know we're still um, i mean we have we've gone back from like being in a military economy to a third world country but there are still people who are working from home you know the divide of the week has become it's very it's become very common for people to have three four days in the office and maybe one two days from like you know as work from home that's the new normal a lot of big companies a lot of institutions it's only in the education sector where we are equating time with knowledge which i don't think it's a 
like any more is a intelligent you know concept to take forward a person can maybe learn whatever you need to teach them throughout the semester in a week or they can learn what you want to teach them uh in an hour rather than a week you know my question is what that person does with that knowledge and how they learn to use it which is important you know how they how they practice it with them with the entire time all right so this brings me just a question popped in my head right now if you were given a chance to teach a photography course as an ai image maker as an ai image maker what would you teach it how would you plan it okay first things first one i would not want it to be like you know 6 7 hours or if it is even 6 7 hours or if it's six you know a studio course uh one obviously it will consist of lectures no issue there but i would like the lectures to be done in a way that they're conveying the crux of the information first and they're going into the fluff later you know secondly i think what is very important is for students it is important to know what their time and place in history is a lot of us we don't do that you know so we okay. what we do is we are teaching them a tool or a technique but we are not teaching them what impact it had on the world that's why they are often creating these artists and these brilliant minded people who do not sit well in the larger variety of things so for the thing is that you know specifically with the advent of ai everybody is understood that art culture image making has a place in the global economy it is not something that is done in your room as a hermit you cannot exist like that anymore so and like you can see as a lot of the current artists who are doing brilliant work right now they exist more as social innovators than the hermit like artist of the you know let's say that 20th century because 20th century was about exploring yourself right right now it's about exploring the world it's about exploring what's out there and you can still explore yourself nobody is stopping you from that but it depends and lastly i would request the students and anybody else who's taking the course that you need to understand that technology is going to go on it's going to keep on happening and maybe even it's going to outlive all of us you know so you can't be in this fomo like state when you're constantly being bombarded by new information and you're constantly panicking because that does not help anybody so i mean there are, there are photographers who are still you know photographing with some lumos camera that was produced in the 1970s and that's their entire thing they photograph with that specific camera they've spent their lives using that as a tool you know so when it comes to ai one person can pick some specific version of a software and just work with that so one thing i guess we often forget about is what about the people who like you know rick gave boys and made cameras out of them there's an entire history of you know the specific kind of i would like to call them artists who were using game boys as cameras who were using these watches that used to come with cameras as like you know proper photographic devices and it's a fun place in history because a game boy with its weird pixels and just two colors was not supposed to be used as a camera but here were people rigging it and using it as a camera also i think photography is much larger than the box that we try to limit it as an artistic practice so i understand your work is coming from that artistic practice and we should only talk about that but the larger role of photography in human history has been something totally different so from today everything yeah so today everything has been changed through the advent of social media but the camera has also been used as a tool for oppression technology uh, technology has a deep rooted history with colonialism as itself it has a deep rooted history with oppression as well and it is because 
people who were colonized or who were you know enslaved that they came very late to these technologies and if you see for example the work of african american photographers who have been documenting ghettos and these slum type areas and they were the first original street photographers because they saw <clears throat> this need to document the life around them they weren't going around documenting you know flowers and pots and bees and birds they were documenting the gritty life that was happening in the streets around them and that was their reality in the same manner photography has been used as a tool of oppression for centuries now you know even in a place like pakistan the british came they took photographs of the so called tribes ki okay, this is you know tribe alizai tribe this is the sayyid tribe whatever they might be and don't you think our parents still abide by that understanding of our genealogy it does you so, know this this so, brings to the and, sorry but this so this sorry just to bring me to this point like so yeah. now we have the power to create those old images to we have this opportunity to alter the history and the question of whether it's authentic or not because we have the visual product there to prove okay and that's another scheme that's another thing to find out if it is a authentic image or not so do you think we can decolonize ourselves through that oh definitely i think one could decolonize themselves just by picking up a camera and recording yourself on your own principles you know and it might sound very weird but having influencers from varied background whether they are south asians whether they are across you know the i would say the economic divide that really does add to the larger conversation of things so one thing that i absolutely love is you know these kids who make vlogs who are not coming from very exuberant backgrounds their parents at times are laborers their parents at times are you know daily wage workers but they do have the right to show what kind of life they are living right and i know they are not photographers they are bloggers but just to say it does democratize everything a bit near me look, at least I, you know I, i also look at it as a new emerging visual culture because they have introduced a certain kind of new aesthetic to overall thing like to overall culture and if yeah. if i just now i'm just thinking if they are you know given the chance to learn programming just a little bit more just a little bit and because of other kind of ai is available they would be able to make their new stuff more stuff anyway do you think should students only be interested in learning how to use a program let's just say how to use a camera or photoshop or should we also focus on teaching students how to create their own programs based on artist needs or their needs because ai is created primarily by software engineers if i am not wrong would it be wise for students to learn about the inner workings of the program or how they are made and could this help mold the future of image making and ai in art i i know it's a very long question so, i'm sorry i can break it down if you want no 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 that's fine it's fine it's just as three parts i mean i would like to you know answer that in order maybe but yeah, in the reverse order like the, yeah the first thing is that people who are working on building these software tools or ais they are not only software engineers you know so for example when you open photoshop and this entire cast of people comes uh, with their names and everything yet yeah, they are literally the experts in visual culture they are experts in image making they are experts in pixels in color theory even in specific colors you know their understanding of color theory their understanding of how color spreads their understanding there are people you know for instance who have been studying that over the last 3 decades which colors have come in trend in architecture in the western sphere and which have gone out now that's a very specific kind of study that is not something an average human would do so yeah. i don't think that these things are made just by software engineers there are there is also a creative storytelling aspect to it 
similarly you know ui ux designers who decides what symbol uh, to use for the brush what symbol to use for the lasso what symbol to use for the eraser how easy or how difficult it is uh, in a same manner you also need to look at like for example you were talking about you know teaching them programming or coding i think if we differentiate the two and a software engineer can do a better job here i don't think we need to produce hardcore coders but it wouldn't hurt for them to have some basic knowledge of coding and how it works so they understand how a certain thing works all right I, mean, um, I would like to say, for example, if we have, if today a lot of us own automobiles, we need to know how to take like very basic care of them. We need to know yeah. how to change the wheels. We need to know how to, let's say, you know, unclog maybe, you know, uh, a petal pipe and so on and so forth. So at least we 20, 30 percent understanding of the thing. So you could tweak it around and customize it to your own, uh, you know, thing. But secondly, then it's goes to the question that AI is very smart at learning what you want from it. So here is a software that is already changing itself to your behavior. You know, I mean, your phones do it all the time. All the you, time. you start sleeping at, let's say, you know, nine o'clock and the third day it's going to tell you that, oh, it's time for you to sleep. You never told your phone that you were sleeping at nine o'clock. That's the beauty of machine learning, but it's kind of scary. <laughs> it might start to dictate me what to make now <laughs> and to break I, away I think from that, that. that i think that comes from like a lot of dystopic uh you know storytelling i think that machine Definitely. taking over the world is coming from a lot of dystopic storytelling because there are other places where you see that you know this green revolution kind of is there as well like you know where whatever happened but machines are literally running the world in a in in a way that they are helping us live you know so for a person who has let's say an artificial heart they are a cyborg will you tell them no you should die because you have an artificial heart that does not make <laughs> any sense right yeah, yeah. that it's a whole different question to what happens when machines are sentient beings oh that's but, completely another i story. mean i like to I call agree. myself yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but please continue. You were saying something. So I was saying that I like to think of myself as a post-humanist because it creeps a lot of people out that what do you mean by a post-humanist? Yeah, what I mean for, is that... For, for the listeners, please elaborate on post-humanist first. So the post-humanist philosophy is that our bodies are mortal shells and there might be a day and a day and an age when our consciousness can be transferred to a machine or a different vessel or even maybe a different body of sorts. Because what makes you, you are your tics, your habits, the way you think about things and not your physical body, you know? And I have my reasons for believing in that philosophy, you know? But the thing is that I do believe that when that happens, humans are going to transcend, transcend their bodies. Whether it's through a singularity that we've gained knowledge to a point that we've started putting our knowledge together in this large singularity, or whether it is through uh, you know making our bodies more durable. Because right now, we are constantly going through a process where we are headed towards death. But... I think Brian Johnson is his name. People are scared of Elon Musk. I am scared of Brian Johnson. You know, <laughs> so it's this eccentric billionaire who's been, you know, doing all these kinds of body last longer. What happens when he does make a breakthrough? So we are already living in a post-capitalist world. What happens to the world when the average age of a person is 120 years? which is not something out of science fiction, which is something very common, you know. That's that's quite an interesting thought, which reminds me of, uh, if you have, I don't know if you've seen uh, the latest season, not the latest, the first season of Star Trek Picard. So, spoiler alert, uh, Jean-Luc Picard dies, but they transfer his consciousness to another body and there's another Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so, 
which takes me to another time like i am thinking of like this would be really interesting when we could we wouldn't need a camera we which we still don't need after the ai thing and image generators but if we could you know have our consciousness our thinking apple we are said all combined together so that when we move our eyes we are taking photographs and it's been captured and then we are editing it to our mind anyways <laughs> that's the like, this is how i see the hopefully... future of photography and ai how do you see it oh definitely definitely that i think hopefully will be the i i i wish that happens because there are moments all the time when you look at something and you're like okay i need to take a picture of this but in the time that you take out your phone or your camera that moment is gone so essentially we are recording after images for years yeah. you know but we've not really been able to record that specific kind of a you know the thing that we wanted unless and until you know there are people like monet who for example like you know painted that specific thing that specific canvas at a specific time for years and years and years that's what i'm saying so essentially what monet did was you know you know that better than me he captured time way before any photographer did you know he was a yeah. painter so I, i you know like it's pretty amazing that how a person would come to this understanding in back in that day and age where he would be like you know what i'm only going to paint the sunset at 7:30 and no other time and his work life. speaks for itself his understanding of life speaks for itself this so, is something yeah. that i tell everyone that this is also because of photography because it hadn't it been photography we wouldn't have been looking at the others what we call abstraction like impressionism and all these things these are actually super realistic things studying light in more depth understanding time in more depth so instead of going to abstraction we went to being super real but anyways yeah, um, yeah. that's just my two cents on it thank you so much and it was wonderful talking to you and i think it not i think it thank i think it's quite me. useful for me and quite useful for others as well i might delete this part
Hi, Sam.